10 years ago on December 8, 2008, I was preparing a Christmas Eve sermon. I was looking for, for something to cut through the noise, something, anything to circumvent the moralistic expectations of my predominantly secular audience in The Hague, the Netherlands, where I was a pastor. And that evening, I, I stumbled onto Mockingbird.com. The first post I read was by David Zoll on W.H. Auden. We who must die demand a miracle. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die demand a miracle. Uh, the moment I read that, I, I immediately knew that David understood exactly what was at stake. I knew that, that Mockingbird understood the torment of the insufficiency of everything humanly attainable. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die demand a miracle. Now fast forward a bit to April of 2012. I felt a gravitational pull from The Hague to New York City just to be at this Mockingbird conference, uh, just to be with other people who who have discovered their own limits and who want to push grace to the limit. I imagine that you are at Mockingbird today for, for that very same reason. Now this is why today I, I relish the opportunity to, to introduce you to 19th century Dutch theologian Herman Friedrich Kolbrugge. I believe Kolbrugge understands our need for a miracle better than anyone I've ever read. Kolbrugge knows that nothing that can save us is possible. Now, chances are you've never heard of Kolbrugge. Little of what he has written has been translated, but for, for what it's worth, uh, Karl Barth believed that Kolbrugge deserved to be mentioned in the same sentence as John Calvin and Martin Luther. Bart believed that Kolbrugge, even more so than the reformers, had plumbed the depths of sola fide and thought through all its logical entailments like no one else before. Now, speaking of Karl Barth, he actually once described the gospel as an impossible possibility. The gospel is both possible and impossible. The salvation is possible, but, but nothing that can save us is possible. We need, we need a miracle. So in that, in that one phrase, impossible possibility, we have, we have what might be uh, the, the most popular word in the American vocabulary, possible. Wouldn't you agree that that's one of the most popular words ever? And we have also what I think is quite possibly the least popular word in our vernacular, impossible. I think Muhammad Ali's famous and oft-quoted line, impossible is nothing, could be our American creed. Uh, case in point, I won't tell you where I saw this, it wasn't in the mail quite yet, but the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, carries the slogan, Real Possibilities. And if you ever go, some of you have gone to their website, you will know that the, the, the website will say, Real Possibilities, no limits, no aging, 
make the most of each day. And it is, and, and here's what killed me. It's smack dab in the middle of the ads for blood pressure medicine and memory loss and cholesterol suppressing solutions. Oh, how we want this to be true. Impossible is nothing. Now this morning, I want, I want to show you how H.F. Kohlbrüche exposes our infatuation with the possibility cult. Now, al allow me just to sketch the briefest of historical backgrounds. Hermann Friedrich Kohlbrüche, born on August 3rd, 1803, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And he died on March 5. 1875 in Elbersfeld, Germany. Now notice that location. Kohlbrüche was born and raised in the Netherlands, but he ends up living and ministering and then dying in a small town backwater in Germany. Not because he wanted to, but because he was exiled because of division in the church. Here's how it went down. On, uh, on Pentecost Sunday, May 13, 1826, Kohlbrüche was a 23-year-old seminary intern at a Lutheran congregation in Amsterdam. Kohlbrüche could not believe the rationalistic inanities of Pastor Uckerman's Pentecost sermon. Uckerman preached the moralistic spirit of the age. Self satisfied virtue signaling, imminentist secularism, void of the supernatural life of God. And Uckerman breathed not a word about the spirit of Pentecost. Kolbrüche clearly and resoundedly res registered his vote of no confidence. Uh, he was then given a, a simple option by his consistory. Uh, recant the accusation or be gone. Young Kolbrüche agreed to apologize for the way he voiced his complaint, but he categorically refused to distance himself from its substance. Kolbrüche was denied ordination and he would never serve a Lutheran church in the Netherlands. The year was 1826. Soon after, Kolbrüche tried to pursue ordination now in the Reformed Church, but again, because he offered punchy doctrinal critiques, his ordination was denied there as well. And so for the next 12 years, because of division, Kolbrüche had no pulpit, he had no denominational credentials, he had no congregation, he had no money, he had nothing. And this is actually only the beginning of a long list of setbacks and disappointments and, and, and heartbreak that Kolbrüche had to endure. After three years of marriage, his wife dies. Uh, he suffers poor health. He gets passed over for professorship in, at the University of Leiden because of theological division. He has to bury two children. He's then exiled to Germany, and instead of ministering in the Netherlands, instead of having a pulpit in the Netherlands, which he desperately wanted, he ends up in the small village church in Elbersfeld, and except for the occasional pulpit supply, he never did full-time ministry or was ordained in the Netherlands. He died in Germany. Now, the, the, the unfair opposition he faced was, was so pervasive and so humiliating. At one point, he's walking down the street in Utrecht and a bunch of hooligans decide to throw him into a canal just for sport because they had heard their parents talk about the theological divisions in the church. I could spend the, uh, the entire allotted time enumerating all the ways that Kolbuch's heart was breaking, but but this morning, I want to focus on one life-altering moment in, 
in Kolbrucha's experience. On the morning of December 7, 1833, he was in his study and he was preparing a sermon on Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Now, the, the first time he read through the passage, it said, for we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnally sold under sin. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnally sold under sin. Uh, it, it, it didn't register, it didn't make much of an impression at all, but when Kolbucha returns to his study later that evening, he, he rereads it, and he has a completely different insight. Now he sees that it says, for we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, comma, sold under sin. Now, Kolbuch had never realized that that verse only made sense if it had a comma. It, it is not, I am carnally sold under sin, but it is, I, I am of the flesh, comma, sold under sin. Now, the, the, the exegetical significance of this comma may seem minuscule and far too subtle to us to appreciate. And I fear that the entire comma episode will actually get lost in translation. But for Kolbrucha, the comma meant, I am, I am not just sinfully carnal. I am not just fleshy in my sinfulness. It's not just that, that I happen to sin. It's not just that I am carnal in part. No, I am of the flesh. The carnality is comprehensive. I am entirely with my whole person, with my body and soul, with mind and will, with all my senses and limbs, carnal flesh in the way that I live, in everything that I do, in everything I think, everything I say and feel and imagine, all my desires, all my inclinations, all my passions, all of them are flesh. And Kolbuch saw that this is true for every believer, every bit as much as it was true for the Apostle Paul. I am of the flesh, comma, born under sin. For Kolbuch, this was like a, a second conversion experience. Here's what he said. I do not know whether anything, el anything else in all my life has ever moved me as much as the noticing of the comma. I am carnal, comma, sold under sin. I am of the flesh, all of me. I fell down before God, worshiped his name, praised him for his mercy, and with inexplicable speed wrote my sermon on Romans chapter seven, verse 14. And with the discovery of the comma came the discovery of the limits and liabilities of the, the flesh. And with that came the discovery of the gospel in the most personable way possible. Over and over in his letters, in the sermons that he preached in Elbersfeld, he would say, I am flesh, I am dead, all of me. There is nothing I can do. The law is spiritual, the law is holy, the law is righteous, the law is good, the law demands perfection, the law requires personal, perpetual, and perfect righteousness, but we are flesh, comma, sold under sin. The, the, the penny dropped and the light went on and Kolbrich said that he was drunk with comfort. Right then and there, Kolbuch said that he had what he called his, his second conversion. 
His first conversion had been in 1826, but he now realized that his first conversion was actually not a conversion to resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He had, it had only been a conversion to more of the flesh, trying hard to measure up by being super pious and religious. So Kolbrecha repented of his repentance. There's, there is no way for me to, to overstate the significance of this moment of supernatural illumination for Kolbrecha. Romans chapter 7, 14 became the key that unlocked the scriptures for him. And it, it resonated with everything that he had now ever seen and read. Now, now he could see it. A, a human being is, is human. Flesh is flesh. Nothing more, nothing less. less. Flesh cannot know God. Flesh cannot reignite or restore a relationship with God. Flesh can do nothing to contribute to salvation except to bring the sin that made it necessary in the first place. But there's a problem. The flesh doesn't just give up. The, the flesh, as you and I well know, uh, wants something, pretends to be something. The flesh wants to be a somebody. The flesh wants glory. The flesh wants to look good. The flesh fondly dreams of moral and religious fitness. We fondly dream of lives of power and lives of purpose and lives of progress, lives of resolute decisions for lifelong devotion. The flesh is confident in the flesh. Kolbrucha began to think through the implications of the comma. Now, at the, at the time in the Netherlands, a spirituality was marked, on the one hand, by a navel-gazing, super-spiritual piety, and on the other hand, by this super-spiritual, intellectual dogmatism. That was the division. And Kolbuch could see it now. On the one hand, angsty piety, desperately trying so hard to be a little better. And on the other hand, angsty dogmatics, obsessive about a perfectly manicured theological system. For Kolbrecha, it was all flesh. The, the super-orthodoxy and the hyper-spirituality was nothing more than a mighty fortress against our God. So that everyone inside the fortress was safe from the onslaught and the assault of redeeming grace. But it was actually nothing more than a spiritual and theological attempt to keep God at arm's length and to save ourselves. Oh, the flesh is stubborn. As Kolbuch said, the old monk refuses to die. The flesh refuses to let go of the illusion, the glory story of becoming a super duper spiritual person. person. The, the flesh perpetually dreams of a mystical arrangement of self-improvement. Oh, the flesh fondly dreams of keeping the law. But cold Brugge knows, when you, when you live from the flesh, you feel good as long as you act good. You feel close to God because you are trying really hard. You feel good about God because you're going to church. You feel moderately optimistic because of your devotions and your fair to middling track record, morally and ethically speaking. You've got the feels because you're pious. You feel good because you have a doctrinal system in place that is purpose. Perfect. You feel good because you have crossed your doctrinal T's for tulip and dotted your theological I's for resistible grace, and it is now your only comfort in life and in death. 
But Kolbuch has said, give it a rest. What are you trying to do? You are flesh, sold under sin. Kolbuch would have none of it. He, he left no room for a bottom-up subjectivity that tries to attach its security to anything other than Christ alone. As it, all a believer can do is, is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The flesh is dead, and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. All offers of religious performance, all self-purification systems, all spiritual step ladders, all sanctification mechanisms are the philosophy of the devil. Flesh is nothing more than a refusal to accept the gospel. The flesh wants to be on the payroll as God in de God's indentured servant. The flesh wants to go Dutch with God. <laughs> the, 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 pro the problem is the gospel doesn't work this way because moral decency and spiritual fervor and dogmatic correctness are not and never have been legal tender in God's economy. The flesh wants to keep up appearances with God, but the kingdom of God does not arrive through a human thingamajig. It is a stunning and miraculous work of God. Well, now, now at last I can explain the, the quirky little title of my talk, Let Not Conscience Make You Linger, Kolbuch's Kama. A few months ago, I heard the modern hymn, Come Ye Sinners, written by Joseph Hart and Matthew Smith. I want you to listen carefully to the fourth stanza. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. This he gives you, this he gives you, tis the Spirit's rising beam. Oh, let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. Kolbuche would say, stop dreaming of your fitness. Stop dreaming about measuring up. Stop dreaming about being good enough, spiritual enough, holy enough, doctrinally accurate enough. Stop dreaming of your piety. Stop dreaming of your personal spiritual progress. Let not conscience make you linger. It is slowing you down. It is worrying you. It is making you anxious. It is holding you back. The law is convicting you. The law is spiritual. The law is holy. The law is perfect. So why fondly dream of the flesh becoming perfect? Believe the gospel. Let not conscience make you linger. To his dying day, Kolbuche believed the Heidelberg Catechism was right. I'm going to read to you question and answer 60. How are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, the law is spiritual. Of never having kept any of them, the law is spiritual. And of still being inclined toward all evil, the flesh. Without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. And Kolbuch had discovered the comma. He found freedom and mind-blowing joy. This is the impossible possibility. Sinners are declared holy. Religion is not supposed to work this way. God justifies sinners. The sinner is righteous. We could have never and would have never come up with a religious system like this. Now, speaking of sinners... 
Uh, I don't know if you heard that uh, our friend Snoop Dogg just came out with a gospel album. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you recall about Snoop Dogg, about Calvin Brodus. His is a sordid story of crime and exploitation. Snoop was a dog who bragged about being a pimp even when he was married. Then he had sex with and prostituted young women and he won four adult industry awards working with Hustler on hardcore porn movies. He settled a lawsuit with a 17 and 18 year old because he had offered alcohol and ecstasy and the flesh all in exchange for them taking their clothes off at a Girls Gone Wild event. As the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. So for the record, his track record is wicked in, in every way. And then he drops a gospel album. Now, I, ha I have to admit, I, I don't can't quite wrap my head around it. And I wasn't sure if I believed it. In fact, I'm still not sure if I do. And I wanted to see if this was for real or for play or for mockery or just for money. And then uh, two days ago, I, I read the lyrics to his song, New Wave. A change for the better. I am reading your letter. There's love on the pages. There's love for the ages. Right, wrong, same song. Your grace still sufficient. No shame we admit it. Your way's a higher way. Can you, can you imagine? Sufficient grace for, for Calvin Brodus? Sufficient grace for the pornographer? Love for the ages, love on the pages for, for Snoop Dogg. Can, can, can you imagine coming to a church near you on song select, lyrics and music by Calvin Brodus? All week long, I've been wondering what Kolbucha would say to Brother Calvin. And he, I wonder, can you say it now? Sinners will be declared righteous. Unholy people will be declared holy. Just as you are, you are holy to me. There is nothing else to do because you are just flesh. It is unthinkable. It sounds morally degenerate. Have we reached the limits of the justification of the righteous? Because Snoop's flesh, all right. Oh, the thought of being at the Lord's table, the thought of sitting next to worship with Snoop Dogg, let alone sitting into heaven. I don't know what, I don't know if he's repented of his sin. I don't know if he has discovered grace, but here is what I do know. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus stands ready to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Come ye weary, heavy laden, bruised and broken by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous, not the righteous sinners Jesus comes to call. Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. This he gives you. This he gives you, tis the Spirit's rising beam. Amen.